Okay, so this is the pre-class video for class number 20, um, our third and last day on um, Islam. And I'm going to, there are a number of outlines. There are a lot of readings, there are a lot of attachments. And so I want you to just find one of the articles and read it. Um, you can read about the choices are environmental, Islam and the environment. So there's an article on um, Islamic environmental ethics, law and society. And I have an outline of that. Or there's an article on terrorism and Aristotle. And I have an outline of that. And then there's another just outline on another article about the environment. And there's a couple shorter articles on Islam and fundamentalism in the schools and um, Islam and fatalism. I think that's just an outline. So why don't you pick either the environmental ethics or the terrorism article. So here's the um, outline for the environmental ethics. And the claim is that the, there's a legal foundation uh, for Muslims. It's formulated by God that and Sharia law is the legal rules and principles. That was what um, Muhammad did not want to be written down, but it's written down. But the main point is that it requires uh, respect protecting the environment because it's God's creation. Um, preser preserving its values is a sign that you do respect the creator. Um, so all of creation is a glorification of God. It's a way of celebrating God. Um, human beings are not the only community we're supposed to respect. As human beings, we respect the other animals. It's not because we aren't different. We are different. But that difference itself means that we consciously respect other animals in a way that is more appreciative understanding of them within the context of the creation than other animals. You, you wouldn't say they don't, res you can't say they respect each other because they don't consciously choose to relate to each other in any sort of way, but we do. And um, we have to balance the universe, avoid unnecessary suffering, this has been a theme throughout the class and every in the Greeks, Greek tragedy, um, balance. And it's not about your generation alone, it's about the future. Um, so we have a comprehensive view of nature. Um, all right. So there's the natural world, and then there's the ethical world and they're related to each other. Our conscience gives us directions for what to do. Um, all right, truthfulness, uh, human environment relationship and sustainable care of nature. All of those things are consistent and their demands basically of Islam. So none of this should really surprise you. Um, and this is another outline of another article about um, Islam and um, environmental preservation. And this, he points out that um, Islam was respectful of the environment and then the Western Westerners develop science and technology and that separated science. That was the exploitation of nature for human well-being. Um, 
and then these other nations were all forced into this western dominated world and now they've accepted it a lot of them obviously but um it was originally part of colonialism um okay Westerners tend to relate to problems created by science and technology with more science. Well, that's what Bill Gates do, does. And there's a woman named Vandava Shiva from India who's very much against that. Um, I, to me, you just have to make judgments. It's too late in the process. So we have to try to integrate with natural cycles, but in, at some point and in some ways, we also have to just re-engineer things or suck carbon out of the air. It's really, um, it's late in the game and we haven't done what we needed to do in the past. So the main thing is I wish the people in charge would just make good judgments because the rest of us do not know enough. Um, all right, so there's three kinds of Muslims. And um, ironically, it's the traditionalists that are more integrating nature and culture. Well, that's the Greek stuff. Those just ancient wisdom is based on that. But modernism is based on exploiting through science and technology. And then fundamentalists, um, also side with the modernists because then they have this belief that it's if it's god's plan for us to uh, destroy the earth so it's kind of interesting that in every religion but especially christianity and muslim, and muslim islam there's traditionalists there's modernists and there's fundamentalists and the fundamentalists in the united states are not that upset about climate change um, but the traditionalists are, because the traditionalists are the Catholic Church, the, then the denominations that unify reason and faith are our tradition, our founders had that tradition, and they would be much more into integrity. So all the sciences are derived from the Quran because the Quran is a, a celebration of the creation. Um, Islamic civilization integrates nature and philosophy and mathematics. The scientists were Sufis. A lot of the big scientists in the West were monks for a long time too. So the most advanced thinkers in the culture were monks and nuns because they were protected and they were the educators of the privileged class. Um, all right, so I guess that's, you can get, you can get the idea. Then there's the primordial tradition, right? The indigenous uh, traditions um, are also really important. So we need to find our way uh, through all of this back to some sort of connection to nature as well as how to integrate technology with returning to some kind of natural cycles. And, uh, and that, you know, I don't have any particular advice. I'm not a student of this, but uh, intuitively obvious it needs to get done. Here is an article, my article about terrorism. So the question was, I was asked to speak on this in Indonesia. And the issue is um, the Indonesians have threats from terrorists way more than we do because they they're, there's extremist Muslims in that area of the world. So I was asked to, and all I did was apply Aristotle's virtues. So how is it that temperance, self-control affects our vulnerability to terrorism. How can we either insulate ourselves or make ourselves more vulnerable to terrorist attacks based on our self-control? Um, so greed is the political evil. It creates this gap between the rich and the poor. 
and social instability. So that nurtures terrorism within the country. The poor are desperate. Um, and so, so within, within a country, you can have um, terrorists. Well, we do have them, they aren't necessarily Muslim, but they're frustrated, they don't have a future, they don't have hope, and they just create problems. And also between countries. So then poor countries will resent the rich countries. So if you don't limit your use of resources and control yourself, you're more vulnerable to terrorism, terrorist attacks in the country and between countries. Um, okay, so what about courage? Uh, terrorism is something to worry about, fear, but you have to figure out how to fear not too much, not too little for the right reason in the right way. So after 9-11, well, before 9-11, we weren't afraid enough of a terrorist attack even though there were a lot of indications that we that there were people in in the arab world who were out to get us mad at us um and so our government at that time was not doing enough to to watch out for it and prepare for it and get um intelligence out there to predict to anticipate and then after 9-11, then we overreacted, or people definitely, some overreacted, people started disagreeing about what's the appropriate reaction. Um, if you don't prevent a problem, politicians can use fear to gain power. So, okay, we didn't prevent it, now we have this problem. The military can take over, the rich can take over and use the issue to build an economic empire, which is what happened in um, 2001 after that. I, again, I have it all documented. Um, for those whole years that Bush was in office, our legal system got very, very um, tilted toward the rich. While everybody's obsessing about those terrorists over there in the Mideast, it was a great way to uh, distract people. Okay, um, political courage, right? The political courage to educate the public and appeal to reason rather than appealing to fear. Um, coordinating, you have to coordinate military intelligence and dip diplomacy and work with a lot of other countries. We did not do that after 9-11. Um, we could have worked with Europe but we did it. We just went over there my way or the highway. And we only had six other countries in the world that supported us when we invaded Iraq. Um, then you shouldn't overreact, not too angry, not too angry, not angry enough, but you need to respond with a plan rather than just emotion. Um, Bush's miseducation of Americans, the international model for using the war on terror, right? He did use the war on terror to structure society. What is a war on terror like? Uh, insurgents, like the insurgents are doing this. What the heck is an insurgent? I mean, the politician could just say anything. And I, I just don't, if I, I wanted to ask people, what do you think an insurgent is? Like, where are they? Who are they? What are they? I mean, because it was not clear. And I don't know, it was, those were sad days. Um, international leaders now after 9-11 have learned this rhetorical strategy and they use it. They use God, they use patriotism. They use God as punishing us for our evil ways. In my students from Southeast Asia said that people use that to, to condemn any sort of feminist movement, women's rights movement, that, oh, God is punishing us because we let women get out of the house and go get educations. Oh my gosh. Okay, so generosity, set up programs for economic development. 
Um, okay, so how do you help potential terrorists find hope in the society and get invested in the society so they don't want to just disrupt things? Um, yeah, provide people opportunities and they, they're less likely to terrorize both within a country and give uh, programs between countries, help countries that have terrorist factions to help those people have a future for themselves. Um, rational humor, make sure that you sort of laugh at your overreactions so that you can avoid phobias. Um, don't create the impression um, that all the rulers are incompetent. Like some are dealing with it a lot better than others. Um, expose it when politicians uh, use terrorism to justify uh, takeovers of power. Keep the issue in perspective. Be sociable. You know, don't don't polarize. I mean, that happened, and it should not have happened. Avoid petty power struggles. Um, avoid responding to irrational prejudices. Um, work on interfaith dialogue. So I'm going to go to Indonesia in um, September and October because Indonesia is one of the top two countries for whom which interfaith dialogues was recommended as a way to sort of alleviate possible terrorist extremist groups from growing. So that's a problem in Indonesia right now. And so I'm going to go over there and talk about the Greeks and the bridge between the interfaith. Um, I don't have illusions about uh, how effective any of it will be, but I, I have that training. And you would know that after taking this class, that a society based on interfaith um, would, uh, you know, I have something to offer them. Um, all right. Rational ambition, make good decisions about your talent, develop it, managing your career in a way that promotes your good and political good. All of these other virtues keep a society stable internally, keep people moving toward flourishing, give people hope, and then that will strengthen you. It will lead to less resentment from the outside and also from the inside. So it just makes you safer. Um, people have to get positions based on merit, um, not based on who their parents are. Rational honor, know what ways of life and choices promote collective well-being. And then that'll, again, that strengthens the, the fabric of society. You honor those who protect us. Um, but you also honor people who prevent problems. All of these things, all of these activities work together rather than competing against each other. Um, okay, Rational rhetoric, that's very important, right? Rhetoric, the media uses terrorism as a sensationalist story. Politicians, I don't know if, yeah, if you, can picture what it was like. I mean, it was very polarized. Um, it's polarized now, but after 9-11, you have to picture what was going on. Plus, I went to college in the 60s uh, during the Vietnam War. So, I mean, I'm used to polarization. This is kind of all I knew. Um, I always thought it was great when things weren't so polarized, but um, all of that is important to understand. How do we cre create laws that will contain the problem? I also think we needed to work with Europe. All the, all the oh, free and open countries needed to band together and then isolate the terrorists. And that's not what we did. We went over there and alienated our allies and that weakened us in our ability to isolate and contain the terrorists. Um, 
all right, so all of these things are the way. Oh yeah, the other issue there was when we had um, Guantanamo Bay and we arrested people for being terrorists without adequate evidence and we tortured them. I read a whole book about this, The Dark Side, our torture program, and it was terrible. Uh, again, I have some scanned uh, 40 pages or so if you want a little taste of it, but people in the rest of the world know the US tortures people and they torture them with no evidence that they did anything wrong. Um, there was one guy who actually sold pretzels on the street and he happened to look like somebody they were looking for. He, he went to Guantanamo and he suffered. And, you know, you shouldn't torture somebody before you even have evidence. I don't, you shouldn't torture them at all, but my gosh. Anyway, uh, rectifying wrongs, don't take revenge, um, avoid these ambitious politicians, um, terrorists mingle in society. It's very different than a traditional war. Um, so you have to just figure out how to best address the problem and not come up with these black and white cut and dried pseudo solutions that never work. Um, okay, the judges, the whole um, court system where the supposed terrorists were brought to court, that was in a... Um, a military tribunal. It wasn't in the federal um, court system. And from what I remember, that wasn't even public. The public did not know what was going on in those military tribunals. Um, the intellectual virtues, you can apply science, technology, social science, you can understand the kind of conditions. You could do things to understand what leads to terrorism and what you can do to prevent it. You can, of course, have a lot of surveillance, but you know, when is too much? When is it too much? Do what is best in the situation. You can't have your goal be eliminating terrorism because it's impossible and you'll end up with a military and police state and you won't have any money for education. It'll all just be protecting you from somebody else is going to beat you up or, you know, terrorize you. Um, okay, so you have to deliberate carefully about those things. You have to be able to persuade the public. There's corruption at every level. Um, oh gosh, there's so many ways that systems can get corrupt. Good judgment is important. Um, recognizing your dependence on the people, weaving the society together. Uh, personal life is not separated from our social roles. And then the union of faith and reason. All of this is also predicated on some sort of God, some sort of ordering force so that in the universe, so that we evolve within this order we can understand this order. We can understand the natural order. We can understand patterns in human affairs. We can understand that all of us are driven by pleasure and fear and that we can choose to develop a sophisticated culture that isolates us or we can choose just to overreact. Um, we can study the history of terrorism, we use our brains. We should really use our brains to figure out how to live. And that's the best way for us to live a good life. And that's what God intended. Definitely the Muslim God, because the Muslim God is the creator and sustainer. And when we study nature, we're studying God. When we study each other, we're studying God. Um, Okay, so we're supposed to appreciate it and take care of ourselves. Why doesn't God stop it? Because then we wouldn't have free will. I mean, God gave us the tools to understand it and to prevent it. 
And so for God to come and intervene means that you don't have to use your reason because God could always come in and change it. Um, th these are arguments for why the power of reason is better. A universe where people have free will, but also the guidebook is better than a universe where people are helpless and they just have to completely blindly depend on some God who seems to act completely arbitrarily. Um, so if the universe as it is, is perfect, then God isn't gonna come and intervene with the natural order or with our free will. Like we act with free will, we take, we pay for it, we pay after death, right? And so there's no better system than that, even if it allows for a lot of evil that's chosen and you're responsible for it. And God allows for terrorism because that's a free choice. It's the wrong choice, um, but God isn't going to take away the choice because then that would take away personal responsibility. Um, and this is Indonesia. This is their Panchasila. And um, they have five principles, like we have the Declaration of Independence. Theirs has five principles. And the first one, they have a democracy based on a belief in God, but it's a very interfaith belief. That's why I like using the Greeks and it, talking about that to the Indonesians because the Aristotle's virtues and all that should make good sense to an Indonesian, especially an educated Indonesian, because that is the foundation underneath all these religions. If you have a view of God that includes all of those, well, then you must have this humanistic foundation. Um, okay, so the U.S. religious toleration is not the same as Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia is much, much more like the Greeks than um, than the US is actually. Principle two is that politicians need to be involved in developing programs that give citizens uh, tools to develop themselves. So the US again has a very radically minimal government intervention uh, compared to other countries and compared to Indonesia. Um, Indonesian unity, it's goodwill and trust are fundamental. It's another big Aristotelian thing. Um, people's, okay, the democracy is led by wisdom, again, it's an ancient word, through deliberation and representation. And so the art of deliberation is the art of knowing what to do in a given situation. Um, people are gathered around a table and they engage in dialogue, and that's very Greek. And then social justice, the equitable distribution of wealth and opportunities. Um, but politicians can, can use religion and fear, um, but it's inappropriate, right? It's wrong. Uh, all the major religious leaders, Socrates, Jesus, Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad, it's very ironic because they were all extremely progressive. They were anti-conservative because conservative was all this, the status quo was corrupt, but religion tends to be conservative. So that's crazy. The stories themselves, the spirit of it, the point of it is extremely uh, progressive, but the religious institutions tend to be extremely conservative. That's just crazy. Um, that's why Martin Luther King's social justice gospel was much more accurate. He did use the tradition, but in the service of progress. Um, so that's why social change can lead to instability. So that's why you have to figure out how to balance what changes and what doesn't change. You have to make sure to educate um, you have to think of this as your responsibility to God, if you believe in God, to be an engaged citizen. Um, and then the five pillars of Islam are consistent with the five points in Panchasila and also with uh, Aristotle's union of faith and reason. 
the first belief is um, that in, for a Muslim is belief in God and Muhammad is his prophet. Um, living in a prayer is a big thing, five times a day. Giving charity, that's another Aristotelian virtue. Fasting is related to self-control. And um, so I think that's really incredible that the pillars are very directly connected with uh, Aristotle's virtues and the two most important ones for citizenship, self-control, generosity, are major uh, pillars of Islam. Pilgrimage to India, uh, to um, Mecca, and the chance for meaningful cross-cultural understanding. And so um, I told the, the Muslims, I told the Indonesians, if you go to uh, Mecca, just talk to other people about your tolerant, multi-interreligious, um, interfaith society that's 88% Muslim because I think everybody should know about it. And there's more moderate Muslims in Indonesia than there are in all of the Arab world. So, um, so I just encourage the Indonesians because I went there and uh, you know, a lot of the people I spoke to, you know, they looked up to America. <laughs> Um, that was in 2012, and they were kind of looking forward. There's the democracy. We want to be more of a democracy, so we have to learn from Americans. But I just told them, you should really try to be the best Indonesia you can be. Um, don't try to change to be like America. There's things you have in your toolkit. Um, but religious intolerance, the, the possibility of a number of Muslims become Muslims becoming more and more intolerant because they are the vast majority. That would be the danger that could undermine their democracy. If, if enough people get convinced that we really need to become a, an Islamic state. So they're struggling with that. And I'm happy to be a part of it, the struggle. Um, this one is about fatalism. It was written by an Indonesian colleague does religion make us more fatalistic? Oh, well, God will take care of it. Or does it make it more resilient? You know, there's a purpose in this. I believe God is testing us, or I believe, you know, this is just strengthens my faith. So um, I want to go through this. My computer is going to restart pretty soon. So I can't go through this, but I would like you to um, scroll through this because it's important. And it was, I heard this talk and I thought, my goodness, this person was just talking about Islam, but this is true in Christianity also, all the same patterns. And then this one was about high school kids. Um, high schools recruit, you know, you have your little club, student clubs, and somebody comes from these more extremist organizations saying, we really need to get back to Islam and our group is going to be really serious about life. And then they take from that group the more radical um, uh, groups that aren't, they don't come to the high schools, but they find the kids that they think might be willing to engage in violence. So they kind of get their recruits from that. So you could think about are there kids in high school? Were there kids in high school that really were looking for something? They were kind of outsiders and they sort of uh, went with this kind of cult 